As we begin this new section in Matthew chapter 14 through Matthew chapter 20 of Jesus' training of the Twelve, it actually has as a frontispiece a final section about John the Baptist. And this is appropriate because in some ways John was the discipling forerunner of Jesus. John was Jesus' closest friend and colleague in ministry. In fact, the Gospel of John indicates that perhaps Jesus before his baptism had shared in some of John the Baptist's ministry. And John's a very important character, individual, and we want to review briefly, of course. John was the voice of one crying in the wilderness to prepare the way for the coming one of God. He was to fulfill the role of Elijah who was to come before the great Messiah of God. And when John sees Jesus wading into the waters of the Jordan to be baptized, he knows immediately that Jesus is that coming one and shares with Jesus at the commissioning service, if you will, of Jesus as he prepares for his public ministry. Well, shortly after Jesus is baptized by John in the Jordan, John is arrested and thrown in prison to rot. And in chapter 11, we read of John's disciples coming to Jesus, asking if Jesus is the one or if they should anticipate another. And in a very gracious way, Jesus encourages John through his disciples by preaching the gospel and doing mighty works of healing and caring for the needs of people and says, go tell John, go tell him what you've seen and what you've heard, that indeed he should keep faith and hope in the midst of his difficult situation rotting in prison. But not only does Jesus do that, he further then turns to the crowds and affirms John the Baptist. What did you expect to see? No, you didn't see a fine dandy living in some kind of a palace somewhere. No, you saw a man who was the greatest of all until the coming of the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus even says to people, if you will accept it, John the Baptist is Elijah who was to prepare the way for the Messiah. And then finally, Jesus stands square, squarely with John the Baptist in ministry and says, John came neither eating nor drinking, and you said he had a demon. I came eating and drinking, and you just called me a friend of gluttons and sinners. It didn't matter, matter how we came to present this message. You were going to reject us. But the message of John the Baptist was so similar to that of Jesus. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you'd like another little glimpse into the heart and the ministry of John, I suggest that you go to the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 25 through 30. In that passage, very briefly, John's disciples are concerned because more and more people are no longer following John in his ministry. Rather, they are going over to Jesus' ministry. And they don't want to lose market share, if you will. But John marvelously says, I am just the best man, and Jesus is the bridegroom. And I rejoice to see the bridegroom arrive so that I can step out of the way as the best man. In fact, Jesus, or John says that he came to spotlight Jesus and to shine the spotlight on Jesus. And a great verse, John chapter 3, verse 30, he says, I must decrease and Jesus must increase. I must become less and less. Jesus must become more and more. So great is John the Baptist. Well, in this passage, we come to the end for John, and I would entitle this devotion for today, Faithful Witness, Faithful to the End. So let us now turn to our passage and read how John meets his demise. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard about the fame of Jesus and said to his servants, This is John the Baptist. He has been raised from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work with him. For Herod had seized John and bound him and put him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. And though he wanted to put John to death, he feared the people because they held John to be a prophet. 
But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before the company, and it pleased Herod, so that he promised with an, an oath to give her whatever she might ask. Prompted by her mother, she said, give me the head of John the Baptist here on a platter. And the king was sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests commanded it be given. He sent and had John beheaded in prison and his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl and she brought it to her mother. And John's disciples came and took the body and buried it and went and told Jesus. Wow, what a bizarre ending to the life of John the Baptist. And of course, we will recognize that in it comes the term that we hear in our parlance even to this day, head on a platter. Somebody does something and another group's not going to like it. And we say, oh, they'll have her head on a platter. Well, indeed. Such was literally the case, not figuratively the case for John the Baptist. And why was John the Baptist beheaded? Well, it is because he was fearless in standing up for what was right. The situation here was that Herodias had been married to Philip Herod, who was the brother of this Herod Antipas or Herod the Tetrarch. And through being in cahoots with one another, Herodias divorced Philip Herod, and at the same time then turned and married Herod Antipas. And that was against Jewish law for Herod Antipas to have in marriage his brother's wife and to connive with Herodias to make that come to pass. And so John is somewhat fearless and courageous saying that indeed Herod is not abiding by the law of God and the word of God, upholding what the Old Testament teaches about such things. Well, this made Herod unhappy, and indeed, being a politician, he would have liked to have killed John, but knew that John was enormously popular, and that would not be a shrewd political move. He was content, though not thoroughly happy, with leaving John to rot in prison. Not so with Herodias. She was incensed. She was the one who was uh, indeed wanting to bring down wrath upon John the Baptist immediately. So we come to the day of Herod's birthday. There is a company and a party. I am being a little bit of inserting something here, but no doubt parties have a lot of alcohol flowing. And Herodias's daughter dances before them. Now the word dance there can mean an erotic dance or a sexually motivated dance, or it can be just a cute little dance uh, of some sort or another. I tend to think it probably was the former, but it doesn't matter. Whatever the dance was, it pleased Herod so much so that he promised whatever she wanted. She went to her mother and her mother prompted the one thing that Herodias wanted above all else was John's head on a platter. Well, Herod was unhappy about this because it was politically a bad move. And we get from the other gospels that he was fascinated with John at one and the same time. But nevertheless, he had made an oath and he could not go back on that oath in the presence of those who were with him. That would have been an even worse political move for they would have seen him showing weakness. They would have seen him going back on a promise and that would have been disastrous for his political positioning. And so he makes the command and John's head is severed from John's shoulders. And so in this strange way, this godly man comes to a demise and meets the end of his life. It should remind us, however, of the eighth beatitude, which says, blessed are you when you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. And that's what John was being persecuted for, for doing what's right, for standing up for what's right, for speaking to what was right in a bad situation by a bad ruler being a bad example to his people. And he was persecuted by losing his life in the meantime. And let us be reminded that we too are to stand up for what is right in the eyes of God, in our culture, and in our society. And when we do so, people will not always give us a pat on the shoulder, congratulating us for saying and doing the right things. No, 
Sometimes people figuratively will want to sever our head from our shoulders instead, as literally occurred with John the Baptist. So let us look to John and see his faithful witness to the end and be faithful witnesses in our time. And let us be faithful no matter what the cost may be. For indeed, those who seek to live for Jesus Christ and according to kingdom principles at some point or another will suffer for their convictions. May we be found as faithful as John the Baptist was in our day. And that's Spotlight Good News. Thank you so much for joining us, and we'll talk to you next time.